All right. Well, um, we've had a request, but we're going to sing anyway. <laughs> uh, you know what? I was ready for an altar call after Brother Campbell sang. Amen. Yeah, that's, that's good stuff, man. That stirs my heart. This stuff, I, you know, I'd like for it to get old, like it has for some of you, but it just, I can't, I can't get past it. I can't get past what Jesus said. He, he deserves my best. Amen. Amen. And I fail at that, but I try. Amen. And uh, the longer I try, the better he gets. And the more he deserves. And the more, you know, I want to try. And uh, thank you for letting us come this week. And uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, we were able to, well, as old friends, we were able to work a little scheduling conflict out. And, you know, I had to drive 110 miles an hour from Portland to get here by Friday. <laughs> we made it, and I'm glad we did. And it's been a blessing to us. So uh, I would ask my wife if she had anything to say, but then she'd start crying. And then she'd use that as an excuse not to be able to play the piano. I don't get all that, because I can't play the piano when I'm not crying. <laughs> but uh, thank you, church. And uh, I heard somebody say this years ago, they said, uh, this helped me as a brand new Christian, they said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Now that might be real simple for some of you, and, uh, but that's my speed right there. And Jesus Christ is the main thing. And you know when we get off track, we get sideways with brothers and sisters and all that, is when uh, we don't keep the main thing the main thing. It ain't about you, and it ain't about me, and it ain't about what we think. It's about what Jesus Christ would have us to do and what he told us in his book. And it's not up to your opinion or mine. It's the Bible says what to do. And uh, if we just hold on to that, we'd be all right. We'd make a difference. Made a difference in my life. Made a difference in yours, right, Ralph? Somebody just keeping the main thing the main thing. Amen. All right. Let's uh, sing about it. No, I'm afraid I have the wrong song. <laughs> or do you want to t talk or say I'm stuff? I'm not sure. <laughs> want to say stuff? Well, the f oh, well, just That's follow good. my okay, lead That's good. Okay, I today. got it. Yeah, thank you. Today. After he said that, I thought, I think I got the wrong song. Okay. Wow. <laughs> That's very short. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
His love will soothe your weary pains. For Christ is in all. Christ is all, all in all. Oh, Christ is all in all. Amen. I was in uh, Harrodsburg, Kentucky. Preaching a tent meeting with Danny Farley, pastor of Shady Acres Baptist Church. And we're preaching, both of us, each night. And he brought one of his men, and he fella stood up there with a guitar. He's a jailhouse preacher. Real faithful, long time. And uh, he sang that song. And boy, I'll tell you what, it grabbed my heart. Amen. Still does. That was written in the 1870s, and nobody even knows who wrote it. It's anonymous. But boy, they had something to say, didn't they? Yeah. If we could keep the main thing, the main thing, there sure are a lot of problems we wouldn't have. All right, now, since I went through the songs in reverse, is this the first one? I guess. Which one? <laughs> Want to change it? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Which one you got? I Which blessed. one you going to play? Blessed. Okay. You all right? Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> When he moves among us, us and all that he does, all of his mercy and all of his love, with the pen of a writer, could write every day. Even this world could never contain how I have been blessed. Overwhelmed, the 
the place where he hides me under his wing. He's not just a song, he's the reason I sing. I have been Help us out if you know it. I have been blessed. God's so good to me. Precious are his thoughts. Who said too much? <laughs> well, amen. Now, I tell you, I have been blessed by this meeting. Starting Friday. I mean, I've been here before, right? I'm thinking it wasn't this crowded. But I pray for y'all. And I'm watching God do stuff. That's what we live for. That's why we leave family and church behind and live in a, in a motor home. I don't call it a RV because we're not on vacation. <laughs> we were somewhere and had a couple extra days and I said to my wife, well, where do you want to go? She said, home. <laughs> but we leave it all behind for ch churches like this, for people that care about God and the souls that Jesus Christ died for, seeing God do what religion can't do, what colleges can't do, what organized nothing can do. I like seeing what only God can do. And I've seen God working in this church since the first time I preached here, and it's been five or six years, something like that. So I commend those of you, some of you I met early on, and, uh, and some of you I'm just getting to know. And uh, praise the Lord. Thank you for letting us have a part of this. Amen. All right. I better stop there because you know how his head will get. <laughs> Worst thing ever. Well, the Bible says, let another man praise thee. And uh, I'm real glad to have, uh, have you as my friend, brother. I really am. All right. Now, been a lot of talk about coffee this week. <laughs> I'm not 100% what a portfolio is, but if you got one in that briefcase, I'm wondering if you might own some stock in the coffee <laughs> industry. <laughs> so I feel that, you know, as a minister of God, I might need to give you guys a little warning here. Uh, you know you've had too much coffee <laughs> when you get a speeding ticket while you're parked. <laughs> it might be a clue if you grind your own coffee beans in your mouth. <laughs> if you sleep with your eyes open, other than what I'm preaching, you may need to cut back a little on the call. If, if the only way you can watch a video is in fast forward, yeah, you might be able to, you might want to back off. <laughs> if you lick your coffee pot clean, I'm not coming to your house. <laughs> if on a hot day you don't sweat, you percolate, yep, you're having, you're doing, if you can jump start your car, Without jumper cables? Yeah, you better. If you can type 60 words a minute, how many can type? You can type 60 words a minute with your feet. <laughs> if you go to AA meetings just for the free coffee, <laughs> you can quit doing that. We're going to have it here on Wednesday and next Sunday and Sunday night and next Wednesday. Yeah, can't go to both. It's in the rules somewhere. <laughs> 
Uh, this says, if the taster's choice couple wants to adopt you, you've had too much. <laughs> if Starbucks owns the mortgage on your house, I'm not asking for a show of hands. Uh, if your first aid kit contained two pints of coffee with an IV hookup. <laughs> if you soak your dentures in coffee overnight, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and if you think CPR means coffee provides resuscitation, I'm with you. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I was in England one time preaching in a prison. And I'm in, a, I'm in a maximum security prison and in the middle of the service. They stopped it. And a guy came up and took orders for coffee and tea. In the middle of a service. I just stopped. Finally, I said, yeah, I have one black too, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's a big deal over there. You better learn to drink it, bro. And uh, amen. We're not doing that here. There'll be no more coffee till I'm done. And I won't get done until I get started. So take your Bible and go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, we're not exactly making a killing on CD sales this week, I've noticed. And there are several CDs on that rack that were made before we ever started coming here. So nobody has them all. So you figure it out. Amen. Let me tell you something about the CDs. My wife gets all the CD money. That was really <laughs> precious. That's her little project, so, you know, come on. Well, how many shopping days are left of Christmas? We're getting there. Get them all a Spurgeon CD. I wouldn't have thought of that, but you put that right in front of my face. Besides, if you like that last song, okay. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 4. Verse number one, Paul says this, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Boy, Paul looked for the Lord to come back his whole Christian life. Amen. Now he's at the end of his Christian life. We're in the end of the second epistle to Timothy, and the Lord realizes that it is highly likely that he may not. So in the passage, in the verses that we're going to read, uh, he gives Timothy his marching orders because the gospel has to go on. Verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Now, in the next three verses, Paul tells us five things about himself. We'll call this the last words of the Apostle Paul. Uh, the last things he says are important. And uh, so he gives them to us here, starting in verse 6. Let's pray again. Father, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord these last few days. And that's an understatement. I don't even have the ability to express how, how much joy I feel at, uh, well, first the people getting saved, but the good spirit here, uh, your, the, your blessing uh, this work and, and giving these folks the fruit of their labor and it thrills my soul. I go places where people are down, and I'm the one to take them a report that uh, you're alive and well, and there's things going on. And truth be known, I've been in four or five churches in these last couple months where a uh, similar uh, experience is going on in Oregon and Idaho, and, and it blesses and encourages my soul. And I pray that these folks would be able to take something from this message and the previous messages that will just help them draw night to you and be a, a light in a spiritually dark world, uh, rejoicing in the fact that they're saved and eternally secure and they've got the Word of God and they've got a church and the freedom to worship. And I pray they take the, uh, the gentle admonishments that their preacher gives them to take this thing real serious, to come and to pray and to give 
And these are real important things, Lord, that you put a lot of emphasis on. And I know we're at this time and place that Paul warns Timothy about. A time will come, and we're there. And we're there in society in this day. And Lord, thank God that there's a principle in our Bible, that there's always been a remnant that refused to go with the flow, and I count it an honor to be amongst them. And I count it an honor to be at New Heights Baptist Church this week. And I thank you for meeting with us and bearing witness to your word. And I pray you'd help me say something tonight that uh, would be a help and benefit to everybody in here. Thank you for saving those souls this morning. If there's somebody in here that doesn't know beyond a shadow of a doubt, they'd step into heaven if they step out of this life. Lord, I pray that uh, you'd make it clear to them that needs to be taken care of, dealt with scripturally, and it can be. And I pray these things in Jesus Christ's name, amen and amen. amen. All amen. right, so last words of Paul, starting in verse 6, uh, he says some things. Uh, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure uh, is at hand. Uh, the time of my departure uh, is at hand. He's not talking about the parole board. Amen. Yeah, you got to remember, he's a prisoner, but he's on death row. He's on death row for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, uh, uh, the time of my departure is at hand. In other words, his sentence is about over. Amen. He's going to be executed. What does Paul have to say about it? Well, that's what he says in the beginning of the verse. For I am now ready to be offered. Amen. Uh, he's ready to to go. Amen. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 9 verse 27 uh, and as it is appointed unto man once to die. And if Christ is your Savior in here eternally speaking you're ready to go too. You're ready to go too. But if he's not if he's not if you're not I'm glad you're here tonight uh, you can go to church seven days a week if you're in here tonight and you're not saved I'm here to tell you it doesn't matter who you know doesn't matter what you know, doesn't matter how good a person you are, doesn't matter what your intentions are, if you're not saved, as of this moment, you are not ready to meet your maker. Amen. And Paul says some things, and he says that he's ready. Now, I travel around, now I hope you take this right, but I travel around the country week in and week out. Uh, we're on the road, I don't know, 11 months a year, average, we go home a couple times, and and uh, she sees the grandkids, and I preach in the uh, tri-state area back east. Say, when do you get time off? I took my retirement first. <laughs> I didn't start working until I was 37, and I reckon I'm going to have to work when I die. That's what my mother said. Amen. So, but all the places we go, and all the preaching, and all the churches, and all the wonderful people we meet, I'm going to tell you something I see and something I'm afraid of. I see a lot of second and third generation Christians that they got it all right here. And they got all the words and they got all the, all, they sing the song, but I'll tell you what, there's a bunch of them I fear that they don't have it right here. And I'm telling you something tonight, being raised in a Christian home and going to Sunday school and youth camp and vacation Bible school and singing specials and, and, and quoting verses is not enough to get you into heaven. You know what Paul said when he came to the end of his life? He says, for I, the time, he says, for I am now ready. And the time of my departure is at hand. And I hope you're ready. Seriously. Amen. I talked to a guy not too long ago and, uh, up in Oregon, and uh, I said, uh, well, are you saved? Yes, yes, yes. When I said, oh, I said, well, tell me about it. When did you get saved? Oh, it was a long, long, long time ago. I don't really remember. I was a teenager. He said, I'll tell you what, I bet you there ain't a teenager in here tonight that's not really saved, that, that is really saved, that can't tell you about it. But he couldn't. You know why? He had some church in him. He had a couple of Bible verses in him, amen, uh, but he wasn't saved. Right. That book says, and there it is appointed unto man once to die. And we've all got an appointment, but there's another appointment. We've got an appointment with death, but we've got an appointment with judgment. And uh, that's what it said there in Hebrews 29, and uh, 
Paul says, I'm now ready. And he knew death was imminent, but he knew that the judgment seat of Jesus Christ was imminent too. And about that, he said, I'm ready. And you may be in here, and, and I, I truly say that. I'm not trying to cause anybody to doubt. Amen. I am causing you to examine yourself. We are uh, uh, admonished to do that in 2 uh, Corinthians 13. Amen. But uh, I'm here to tell you. Uh, let me ask you something. Uh, you can say, I'm saved. If I die, I'm ready. I'm going to heaven. I'm not worried about hell. Good. But are you ready to give an account? Are you ready to stand before Jesus Christ or kneel or crawl, whatever the case may be? Are you ready? It says this in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. For we must all appear uh, before the judgment seat of Christ. That's not a all without exception. Rightly dividing the context is that he's writing an epistle to a church. So he's talking to saved people. And he's saying to saved people, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. If not, you're not going to be judged for sin there. If you're saved, Jesus Christ took care of that. But there's a judgment for the born-again child of God where he'll give an account to Jesus Christ for what he did with the life that Christ bought for him. Now, that's not deep, uh, but I'm going to tell you something. Paul was ready for it, and I'm asking you if you are. Amen. And, uh, and if, man, if there's things going on in your life right now that you wouldn't want to be talking to Jesus Christ face to face about it, uh, hello, I'd, I'd uh, seriously consider doing some soul searching and getting some help if you need to and getting things right now. Amen. Amen. Uh, amen. I remember the guy talking about smoking and he said, I hope, I, I, I said, wouldn't it be bad if you took a puff and there Trumpet blew, and you had to exhale right in Jesus' face. Amen. It got real quiet. I don't, usually it doesn't get that quiet. <laughs> I didn't smell any. Okay. And I would know, amen, that was a battle for me. But these days, these days, and I'm in church every week somewhere if I'm employed. Yeah. And I have to be employed, amen, because I you say know, we're on vacation all the time. Amen. <laughs> These days, it seems like many Bible believers have chosen to live like going up, whether, whether it's a trumpet or by way of the, uh, the grave, uh, going up brings them down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah, amen. It's like we, uh, let, me, let me put it like this. The expression, rude awakening, probably doesn't adequately describe the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. By the way, you guys got a lot of brighters out here, out west. And, and uh, brighter said one time, he said, well, you know, you know, uh, uh, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, they won't have a place at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, they will. And he said, no, they won't. They, they were Methodists. I said, my wife and I are going to get up and give them ours. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> and then I thought that was pretty smug until I thought later, that guy probably doesn't even believe we'll have a seat at the marriage <laughs> supper of the Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> what a bu You know, the Lord wanted to make things so simple, and even Baptists can make them real complicated. Sure. Amen. Yeah, yeah. You know, I got a perspective coming from the world I came from. I just look around, and, so, and I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. Now, Paul said this in verse 6. Now, he said uh, five things, and he said this. He says, uh, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. And uh, I just want to say to you that you better be ready too. Now, Paul has uh, been a prisoner. He's getting executed shortly. Amen. You might be young. You might be strong. You might be healthy. Boy, those things change quick. I mean, health changes quick, but age does too. Let me tell you something. I, I listen, when I was in my 20s and my 30s living like a heathen motorcycle gang member, I never for a second dreamed I'd be 64 years old. I'd have taken better care of myself. That's what they say. Uh, uh, I'm going to say this. This getting old thing, 
It ain't for wimps. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Air bump. Okay. Amen. <laughs> but you know what the thing is? There's people that, uh, 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 okay, let me say it like this. Proverbs 27, verse 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And you don't have a guarantee you're going to wake up tomorrow, no matter who you are. No matter what you got. So I tell you, you need to be like Paul in that you better be ready. Now, first thing you got to do is be saved. But if you are, praise the Lord. But in the course of a, 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 a praying for revival, I mean, don't you think it's logical that the Lord would say, hey, what about this in your own life? And of course he will. If you sincerely pray, the first thing you're going to have to come face to face with is anything in your life that might hinder your prayers. Isn't that rocket science? Not at all. Amen? So uh, perhaps you need to, if you want to be able to say you're ready, maybe you better do business at an old-fashioned altar yourself. I'm going to do it. If they don't do it, I'm going to do it. Seriously? After five, okay. <laughs> that was close. I mean, if I got to do that too many times, I think I'm with John Wesley's crowd. Amen. <laughs> oh, oh, there's that awe again. Now, nah, I'm, I'm keeping track. I heard it when I said something about my wife. And, and then, okay, I don't even remember. <laughs> the time of your departure could be just around the corner, too. So I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready. Amen. Uh, uh, that I read my, t read my title clear. How's that go? Amen. Yeah, man. You can have a clean title, too, when you get there. You can have it short, at least. Short list. Don't let that baggage build up. Amen. Don't let it. It'll hinder you. It'll hurt you. It'll hurt your testimony. You won't come within a million miles of the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, you'll still be saved. Yeah, and then you get to spend the, the millennium on the sidelines like you did down here. A thousand years is a long time to watch God and God's people move and, and sit on a bench somewhere doing nothing. People do it now. I don't know why, but boy, a thousand years is a long time to be doing it. All right, so then verse 7, and he says the second thing. He says, uh, I have fought a good fight. Now, Paul is a preacher, and Paul is an evangelist, and Paul is a missionary. Let me tell you something else he was. He was a fighter. Paul was a fighter. Uh, uh, Bible Christianity to him, living for God to him, wasn't a hobby, wasn't a game, wasn't a club or a clique or something to do. It was his life, and it was a fight. And he admonished Timothy in the first epistle to fight the good fight. Of faith. And now when he gets to the end of his life, he says this. I have fought a good fight. You know what that means to me? Uh, his life wasn't wasted on bad fights. That's what that good fight means. Uh, I heard it said years ago, pick your battles wise. I'm Irish, man. We'll fight at the drop of a hat. What I have learned is there is not enough time or energy to fight every fight. And so it is in the Christian life, too. Amen? And a lot of time and energy gets wasted on bad fights. We Every time we go through an election cycle, I watch Christians get wrapped around the axle about things that ain't going to amount to a hill of beans, win, lose, or draw, and the devil just uses all that to get people's focus off the good fight. And you're, you're allowed to have opinions about all that stuff, and I certainly do. Amen. But we're not talking about that. We'll talk about that during the fellowship time. And if your opinion is stupid, I'll be the one to tell you. But <laughs> amen. <laughs> My mom used to say, uh, David, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. How many heard that growing up? What does that mean? Well, she said, well, if you do that, then you've got to deal with a mountain. Wouldn't it be better just to leave the molehills? Molehills? But I'll tell you what, man. Some people, uh, they've got to make a federal case.
case out of every little thing. They do. You know what I call them? Drama junkies. And I didn't even know what a drama junkie was when I was lost. Back then, we were fighting for our lives. Now I get saved and I'm in church. And boy, some of you, you don't have enough energy to do nothing for Jesus Christ. But you can make a big deal out of nothing all day long. Let me tell you something. The only person that's pleased with, the only person that's pleased with that is the devil. Amen. Why? Because it distracts from the main thing. Who remembers what the main thing is? Let me hear it. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Paul was careful to stay focused. Careful not to get distracted. And man, he's just like we are. You read through the epistles. You read what he wrote. You read through the book of Acts. He had... He dealt with things, wanting to get back to Drew. He was just like us. But boy, I'll tell you what, by the time he got to the end of his life, uh, he's human. But boy, he was able to say, I fought a good fight. How about you? How about you? You think you'll be able to say it? Some of you, it's a long way off in the future if the Lord tarries. You better get a hold of it right now. That ought to be what you're shooting for. Amen. Amen. And then he says in verse 7, then the next thing he says this, I finished my course. Now what a thing it is, it must be a great sense of satisfaction that comes with coming to the end of your life and being able to say that. Now my Bible teacher, Dr. Michael Hanstein, he is a Vietnam veteran, spent 28 years in a wheelchair, went home to be with the Lord in the middle 90s, or no, late 90s. Amen. And on his headstone, along with his combat infantryman badge and his purple heart, it says, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Now that, that tombstone is about a mile from my house, and I go there. When I go home, I go there on occasion, and I drive through that cemetery, and I walk over there. And I look at old Brother Mike's headstone, and he's probably the finest Christian I ever knew. And, uh, and I look at that thing, and I was there when we buried him, and I said, that's right. <coughs> that's not a stretch. That's true. That man lived it, and he died talking it the way he lived it, and living it the way he talked it, and helped a lot of people, and helped me. Amen. And I think to myself sometimes, I hope that the Lord tarries. Someone's able to say that about me. Uh, if it's true, Susan, if it's true, you have my permission to have them put that on my headstone. But not if it's not true. For Paul, it was true. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. And I, I want to be able to finish mine. Don't you? All right. Uh, many people reach the inevitable end. There's an appointment with death. Many people get to that place with lots and lots of regret, but not Paul. He finished his course. His course began on the road to Damascus. Take your Bible, go to Acts chapter 9. Now his course began there uh, uh, when he got saved. And it says in verse 5, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? When he says he finished his course, here's why he had a course. He asked for it. He asked the Lord, what a concept. Boy, I think that would go a long way. Amen. A, a, a lot of Christians, they'll take the gift of eternal life, but they won't ever ask the Lord. What will you have me to do? They're afraid of the answer. I think they sit in church hoping that they don't get uh, asked to do something, hoping they don't get nailed, not wanting to respond, to yield, afraid God might call them. Don't worry. He doesn't call cowards. Don't worry about it. He ain't going to call you. He can't trust you. He ain't going to call you. But I'll tell you what, he called Paul because Paul asked him to. Paul was zealous about his life when he was lost like some of us. And he just, it just made sense to him to, to refocus all that zeal, 
toward uh, uh, the sinless Savior that uh, forgave him all his sin. And he said, what would thou have me to do? And the verse goes on and says there in Acts uh, 9 and verse 6, And the Lord said, well, Paul, this is what I want you to do. I want you to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and, and the children of it. Is that what it says? No. It doesn't say that at all. It says this. Arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Yeah. The Lord's talking to him. Why did the Lord just give it to him? Because the Lord was setting a precedent right here, uh, that he's been using ever since. Because there ain't a person in here he, he appeared to in person on any road. And so he's laying down a precedent here, and this is how God does it. And he even sent the apostle Paul to a man, and it was Paul's choice to go or not. And he did it. And that's the way the Lord still does it. And the Bible says he's given us uh, apostles and prophets. And somebody said, well, we don't have them anymore. I do. I read about them all the time. And then it says evangelists. And then uh, pastors and teachers. And that's how God still does it. He ministers his word through men. Amen. And uh, a lot of people I've met since I've been saved, they'll never be able to say, I finished my course because they absolutely refuse to be told what to do. Amen. It's called a rebel. Uh, uh, the Bible says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and, in, and stubbornness. It's not cool. Amen. It's as this iniquity and idolatry. Amen. Let me tell you what's cool. That book says in James 4 and 7, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to thee. That's your course. Amen. You going to be able to finish yours? Verse 15 there in Acts chapter 9. Uh, 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 the Lord talked to Ananias and he said, Go thy way, for he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And God used Ananias to deliver that commission. And uh, that's Paul's course. Number one, to bear the Lord's name. But there's three parts to it. And the order in God's economy, the order is always important. And that's what Paul got out of sorts a few times. He was going to bear his name to the children of Israel, and God said, no, 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 not yet. And uh, there's one more detail to Paul's course. And I, would, and I look at this, and I'm thinking, man, no wonder you were glad to be uh, finish it. It says there in uh, uh, verse uh, 16, there in Acts 9, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And you think, I think about the Apostle Paul, and I thank God for the Apostle to the Gentiles. Amen. Greatest Christian on the planet. Great example. Uh, amen. He's uh, my hero. Amen. Why would God put that on him? Great things he must suffer. He went out and did what? He bore his name before Gentiles and kings and the nation of it. He did those things. But boy, part of his course was great things he must suffer. Say, well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, if you read your Bible, you remember that in Acts chapter 8, in verse 1, Saul, his name was Saul at that time, was consenting unto the stoning of Stephen unto his death. He was good with it. He encouraged him. He's a cheerleader. Amen. For, 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 for persecuting Christians. Uh, verse 3, there in Acts chapter 8, says this, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. You know, uh, you know, these days, people talk about door-to-door -door visitation. Do you know where that started? <laughs> Acts chapter 8. Door-to-door <laughs> -door visitation was Saul hailing men and women to prison. That's what he is doing. And the Lord is merciful to him. But the Lord don't forget those things. And in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, it says this, And Saul, yet breathing, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples, of the Lord. Amen? So the Lord told him, you know, that uh, your course is going to include some great 
things you must suffer. Let's look at them. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says these uh, five things. He says, uh, uh, that, uh, for I'm now ready to be offered. In the time my departure is at hand, you better be ready too. And he said, I fought a good fight. And you need to get a hold of this thing. Bible Christianity is not a game. It's not a social club either. It's a fight. Amen. And there's a lot of people that don't take that thing seriously. And I preach to their empty pew all the time. Somewhere. Amen. And then he said, I finished my course. And God's got a course for you and a course for me. And mine's not like Paul's and mine's not like your pastor's. And yours isn't like mine or Paul's. But you got one. And you need to ask God about what he would have you to do. Amen. Amen. That book says in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto your own, thine own understanding. And that's the way we're wired, buddy. That's what we do. We got it. We got it figured out. And that's 100% operating in the flesh. And that's a formula for disaster. That's why the next verse says, in all thy ways. Not just, you know, once in a while or if you need me. It says, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy, he shall direct thy, thy path. Uh, we need God to direct our path. And Paul knew that and he asked God to direct his. And uh, you'd do better to uh, ask God to direct yours. And I'm just telling you, it'd save you some of the trouble. And then you could say, uh, here am I, send me. When the preacher says we need somebody to put stickers on bottles or carry them out to the fair or what else going on. You don't have to say, I'll pray about it. Amen. You just help if you can. Because you want to help if you can. You know, we do these days. The preacher had something. And we, are, we are digging for excuses. Why we can't. Oh, I'd love to. Liar. <laughs> Stinking liar. Quit lying. Get right with God. Oh, but I thought you were such a nice preacher. Give me three more days, you'll hate me. <laughs> Not really. I'm trying to help you. You get that, don't you? You understand that? So quit lying. All right, now he's moving on. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse, let's pick it up, verse 24. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice uh, was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And he didn't live in Colorado. <laughs> Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Now I was a paratrooper in the United States Army. And I jumped out, out of airplanes. And people say that's crazy. And my response to that is if you ever landed in a C-130, you would know why we jumped out. It was a smoother landing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what's crazy. The Navy. Is, are we any Navy vets? Anybody in, was in the Navy? Going out there on a ship where there's fish bigger than you, that's crazy. Yeah. Paul's floating around on a board three times. I'd have went insane. A minnow would bump my ankle and I would have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> I'd rather fight a lion heads up on dry land nice. than try to breathe and, yes. yeah, okay, that's just personal. That blows my mind. That's why you'll never hear Dave Spurgeon drowning or getting going down in a shipwreck because I ain't getting on no boat. <laughs> Somebody said, Brother uh, Spurgeon, have you ever been on a cruise? Yeah. Across the Sandusky Bay to Cedar Point. You know, it's one mile. Amen. <laughs> Verse 26. He said, great things he must suffer. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Wow, a lot of peril. And in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides all that, and then he puts this, Besides those things that are without, uh, which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. I think the care of all the churches, in other words, trying to uh, 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 play nursemaid to a bunch of new Christians was equal to all that other stuff. 
I just said that because I'm leaving town tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. And the last offering's already been taken. <laughs> Hasn't it? <laughs> Any extra money tonight will be from selling coffee. <laughs> Amen. I didn't get the curry out next to the, uh, at the, uh, okay, moving on. Now, here's what I want to say to you. Now, what Paul had to say about that passage is the ultimate antithesis to the victim mentality of the age and the, and the Christians of this age as well. 2 Corinthians 12. Verse number 9. Now here's what Paul had to say about it. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Boy, when he says, I finished my course, that included the great suffering. No wonder he was ready. Amen? Let me tell you something. Whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through, whatever's ahead of you, one of these days it's going to be in the rearview mirror. Amen. Amen. This is going to end, and we're on the right side. Wouldn't you hate to struggle all your life and then hope you go to heaven? Wouldn't you hate to struggle with the things that are common to man, Amen. And with the world, the flesh, and the devil all working against you. Amen. And then uh, all the time living in the back of your mind, uh, uh, having some fear that you might end up in hell too. I don't see how people live. I'd go back to drinking and drugs if, I, if that's what it was. I really would. I wouldn't be able to handle that. But I got a peace from God in my soul that I know where I'm going to go when I die and come hell or high water. I know how it's going to turn out. That helps me. Amen. Amen. That's why I don't freak out all the time like people freak out. Amen. Bible says tribulation will work of patience. I got a lot more patience than I once had. Some of you do too. Some of you are going to get some. You're going to get it the hard way. Because that's how you get it. Just get it. He wrote to Timothy also in this epistle, in the chapter before, the one our text came out of and said in, in verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And uh, suffering's part of the package for all that will live godly. But you know what? We read that and we think, okay, we're always looking for loopholes. Well, does that mean if I don't live godly, I won't suffer persecution? Yep, that's what that means. You won't suffer persecution from being a Christian. You think the devil will leave you alone? He's already got you on the run. If you're not going to live godly, he's already got you on the run, and he's going to run you down until you're wore out and you don't have a testimony left that could affect anybody seeking whom he may devour. You know what the most, uh, biggest thing most of us suffer uh, uh, from being a Christian is, 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 is somebody driving by and giving us the finger. Yeah, I used, to try to, I used to try to think of a more elegant way to say that. Then I decided I don't want to find a more elegant way to say it. Yeah, uh, uh, somebody slammed the door, I knocked on the door and they slammed it. You poor baby. <laughs> oh man, you are getting, you'll get a crown for that. The martyr's crown for sure. <laughs> right. Really, you know what I mean? People act like, act like they're martyred for coming to church. Right. That's just doing your duty. What a bunch of wimps we right. got. Right. Yeah. Laodicea. We're in the Laodicea church age. Everybody get that? Everybody know that? That's Greek for wimp. Mm -hmm. I just made that up. The Lord makes me tell on myself. The biggest thing I suffer... Personally, as for being a Christian, is telling my flesh no. And truth matter is, same goes for you. And you know where your problems come? Because you don't tell your flesh no sometimes when you should. That's the fight. 
He says, uh, I fought a good fight. I finished my, number one, I'm ready. Number two, I fought a good fight. Number two, uh, three, I finished my course. And then he said, I've kept the faith. I've kept the faith. Now, faith, according to Hebrews 11 and 1, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not saved. You're saved by it. Uh, you're sustained by it. And Paul says, he gets to the end of his life, and he says, I've kept it. You know what I say? I want to be able to say that. I hope I can say that. Don't you say it, because you're not there yet. But, boy, that's what you ought to shoot for. Uh, faith is believing God when it comes down to things you can't explain. That's what faith is. That is not hard. You know why? I'm not like some of you. I'm not real smart. Amen. There are so many things I can't explain that I don't even waste any time trying to. Trying to. I don't Google everything. <laughs> Amen. I had a guy in jail one time. He says, uh, well, well, how can you explain the Trinity? You know, your past will inform you what that means if you don't know. I said... <laughs> Huh, it never occurred to me to try to explain it. I just believe it. That's what faith is, believing what God said. You know what the Bible correctors do? They come to a place and they can't explain it, so they change the book so that they become the final authority. You know what's scary about that? That means, that means uh, uh, they've got a God that's no smarter than they are. I, I'm glad there's a lot of things I can't explain. I'm glad I got a God that holds tomorrow and can make all things work together. I'm glad I got a God like that. Faith is believing God when it comes to things you can't explain. That's easy. There's a lot of things we can't explain. But faith is trusting God when things are going on you cannot understand. And I've seen some Christians I get it, man. I get it. The lost world, I get what I get where they're coming from. I understand about reaping and sowing. But I'm gonna tell you what, I've seen some precious I I've seen uh, God bring the hammer down and uh, on on Christian that flaunted his mercy and 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 but I've seen Christians go through things I can't explain why God to let that happen. And some people get mad at God when things like that happen. And I'm telling you, I just, my faith is, he knows what's going on. He knows what he's doing. The Bible says, and, uh, and, uh, and we know, we know, we know, because the Bible says so. It doesn't say, and we feel that all things work together for good. No, it says we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Amen. And that's the God to have right there, because... I don't understand a lot of things that are going on, but I know who does. And uh, that's a God that can make them work out. Paul said, I kept the faith. And he wrote in uh, the Romans uh, chapter 10, uh, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And, and faith is believing what God said. All the way to the end of your life. That's where we find him. And he says these five things that were important to him. I'm, I'm now ready to be off in the time my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. In a verse 8, the fifth one. Uh, and, and, and Paul longed to see the Lord. Like I mentioned, it's mentioned in verse 1. Verse 8, henceforth there is laid up for me, henceforth, because of the things that precede that word. Henceforth, you follow that? Henceforth, because of those things. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. That day when he sees his Savior, he looked forward to to it. He longed for it. And after everything Paul went through, and we read some of it there in 2 Corinthians 11, after everything he went through, not because he's a human and makes, after everything he went through for the cause of Jesus Christ, I'll tell you what, Paul deserved a crown of righteousness. I got no problem with that at all. Amen. But five things about Paul. 
and one thing about you in these verses because the verse didn't stop. Verse 8 goes on and says, uh, Not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That same crown of righteousness Paul got for 30 years of all the things you went through. You can have it too. You can get it too. You don't get the crown of righteousness by waking up in the morning and saying, Oh, I hope Jesus comes back today. I just hope Jesus comes back today. There's a little more to it than that. And the word henceforth is what tells you that. So you can have the crown of righteousness just like Paul got, but you're going to have to get it the same way he got it. And you're going to have to be ready. You're going to have to be ready to be offered. Number one, you're going to have to be saved. And then you're going to have to keep short accounts because you're going to have to give an account of yourself to God. You're going to have to fight the good fight of faith too. To get the crown of righteousness, you're going to have to fight the good fight. Don't quit wasting your life, your time on bad fights. That's what we do. That book says, only by pride cometh contention. And there's a lot of contention in the world, isn't there? There's a lot of contention in the church. I'm talking about the body of Christ. There's a lot of contention in churches and families. And it's all because of because the book says, only by pride cometh contention. That's the problem. That's the problem. So fight the good fight of faith and quit. You know, somebody need to get up here and say, God, forgive me for wasting my energy and my influence on bad fights that ain't going to amount to a hill of beans and help me to get the main thing back first in my life. And you're going to have to finish your course. To get that crown, you're going to have to finish your course, uh, just like Paul did, and he's got a course for you. And let me give you two suggestions. Number one, ask the Lord. Ask the Lord what he'd have you to do. Then ask your pastor. Ladies, ask your pastor's wife. Ask them. Amen? And you and me both know why you don't. Because you don't really want to know. You want to direct your own path. You want to pick and choose where you go and what you do. That's not a servant. Amen? You want a crown of righteousness? You ought to. Jesus Christ deserved for you to strive for it and get it so you can lay it at his feet out of gratitude for saving your soul. You ought to see an opportunity, whether it's the soul winner's crown, whatever. You ought to say, I can get that. I want to get that. Not for your big head. They don't make it your size. But they'll make one you can return to your Savior out of gratitude for what he did. Amen. Amen. Finish your course. Keep the faith. Here's why that goes. Paul said in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Committed. Faith is committing beyond retreat. Well, every time I go through San Antonio... I mean, I don't know, every couple times I go, I'll go to the Alamo. I've been there several times. I never fail to be inspired by William Travis pulling that sword and drawing a line in the sand and challenging those men to step over. And they stepped over unto certain death. That Bible, that sword right there, that's what it does. Somebody said, Brother Spurgeon, do you get many decisions when you preach? Every single time. Because every single person makes a decision every time they're challenged by the Word of God. And that Bible will challenge you to step over the line. Commit beyond retreat. <laughs> the difference between us and those guys, David Crockett and Daniel Boone, is we know 
who's going to win. They didn't. And they didn't live. But I'm going to. And to me, that makes it real simple. Amen? Paul longed to see his Savior. He said this, uh, For me to live is, gain, is Christ and to die is gain. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. I concur. I mean, and I'm, listen, I'm not looking forward to my disappearing. I'm having a great time. I love what I do. I love who I do it with. I am, I am having the time of my life serving Jesus Christ. But to die is gain. And so I'm ready to go. Are you? He said uh, to be with Christ, which is far better. That's where he is right now. He's with his Savior. And you know what? He didn't go empty-handed. Amen? <laughs> Paul's exit strategy was up. <laughs> and yours should be too. Is it? You ready to be offered? Here's the evidence. It's how you live between right now and your last breath. That's what will determine whether or not it's just talk or lip service. Who you live for tomorrow on Monday, that's what will determine that. But I'm going to tell you what. If we can get a hold of this right here, some of the things that Paul uh, 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 said and the Holy Spirit left in that book, and we can apply it up, you know what will happen? You know what the fruit of that thing is? You won't go empty-handed either. It's all stand. Go ahead, preacher. Father, Lord, we uh, thank you for this night. Thank you for the time to 